Hi there. My name is Gregory Crane, and I'm pretty clearly the outlier in this series of videos. Uh, I'm not an editor, uh, but I am a student of Greek and Latin. Now, my particular position or position says something about the complexity of the world of which we are a part. In the United States, I am a professor of, of classics uh, at Tufts University uh, and an adjunct professor of computer science. But I also hold a position in Germany where I'm Alexander von Humboldt Professor of Digital Humanities in a Department of Computer Science at the University of Leipzig. These two different departmental affiliations reflect, I think, the transformation that the study of Greek and Latin of all historical languages and the humanities as a whole is currently undergoing. Now, I've been studying Greek and Latin uh, in a, some kind of professional capacity since I began as a graduate student in the fall of 1979. Uh, and a lot has changed and a lot hasn't changed. One thing that has changed has been the role of Greek and Latin within the study of the Greco-Roman world. Uh, we no longer really can build our careers, at least for now, as much on the study of these languages as was typical when I was first starting out. When I started out, you could build a career writing editions or commentaries or doing rare, what we call philological work uh, and have very good expectations for what would happen. But really, there's been a shift away from that in the field and away towards more uh, literary, critical, analytical uh, kinds of research uh, as opposed to the more textually oriented. This has been a, a shift that reflects the changing demographics and the changing uh, economic base for the study of Greek and Latin in American universities. Now we support ourselves primarily by teaching people who read our texts in English translation. Uh, and we don't support ourselves as much with languages uh, and with the study of Greek and Latin as we did before. We're now really at an inflection point where I think this, this trend can reverse itself. And this inflection point is reflected by the possibilities of new technology. Now, one major change that we're thinking about, and it's, you can see occurring in some aspects of our field, is a shift in intellectual culture. When I began, uh, we were in a very strict uh, and precipitous kind of hierarchy. You really didn't have any kind of a, an academic voice uh, until you were an advanced graduate student or a junior faculty member. You really had to have a lot of credentialing before you could do anything that was useful. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I remember realizing as a, when I was writing my thesis that the thesis was really just an academic exercise. There was no way really to contribute anything that anyone would find useful or, or admit to finding useful. It was a very hierarchical culture. Uh, but it was also a very rigorous culture. We were challenged to master reading lists, to master a lot of material. It was very tough. Uh, it was a certain kind of education, but it was really a kind of education that reflects how well you can master a curriculum that someone else gave to you and that always reminded you what your position was in the hierarchy in a kind of an intimidating way. What's different now is that we've shifted to a world where we're no longer able to think about or focus primarily upon a relatively small number of texts that you could find distributed in academic libraries. Uh, the typical PhD reading list focuses on about a million words of Greek and Latin, and scholarship tend has tended to cluster around this relatively small canon, in part because it doesn't make a lot of sense or it doesn't give you a lot of payoff to write books and scholarship about authors that nobody can see because nobody has copies of the books. Well, the situation now is completely different. We can already identify a billion words, at least a billion words of Latin that are available online anywhere on earth to anyone with reasonable access, broadband access to the internet. That means a billion smartphone users. And this information includes not just many different versions or not just every single Greek and Latin text that survives from antiquity, but a vast amount of material that was produced in Greek or Latin, especially Latin, after the ancient world and in which much of European culture was defined and invented. This enormous uh, 
body of material, virtually unstudied, is so huge that the small number of professional scholars uh, are simply unable to process it by themselves. We do now have at our disposal uh, automated methods so that we can find all sorts of patterns in this vast body of material. These patterns include the ability to see, for example, where uh, Virgil's Aeneid is quoted over thousands of years, which passages in Virgil's Aeneid are, are quoted where and by whom, for example. Uh, we can also trace ideas across languages and culture. Uh, and so we can see Christian or Muslim or various scientific ideas rising and falling and, and circulating uh, as we're able to analyze better the huge million plus book collections that are now online. But a lot of these automated methods really don't give you knowledge, they give you interesting statistical uh, probabilities that something here is interesting. All of these automated methods require and produce a need for an immense amount of close reading and a very traditional humanist analysis. Far more than we could ever do, uh, as I say, among the professionals who exist. We have a particular need for a whole series of editions uh, of ancient and modern texts that are quite different from those editions to which we are accustomed. Now, one thing we have to bear in mind that's also different, it's not just that we have lots more materials and a lot more questions we can pose of these materials and a lot more work that we need to do. What's also different is we have to rethink our audience. Uh, when we talk of classics and we speak, when we mean Greek and Latin, now, we have a problem because we're replicating in the 21st century a very problematic mindset from the 19th century where Greek and Latin were the only classical languages because, of course, European culture was the dominant culture. We need to think now of how our Greco-Roman texts, how our, our sources can be received by uh, a global public and how we can frame a different kind of classics, one of that is a field that engages with classical Chinese, classical Sanskrit, classical Arabic, Persian, uh, any historical language. And this is a really different mindset and it has really major implications for the kinds of work that we need to do. Now, what's different from my point of view about editing is that editing uh, in the 21st century does continue to think about how we reconstruct what the original text might have looked like. But in the 21st century where every manuscript, every critical edition ever produced can be represented uh, online at a very high resolution, these objects which before were a means to reconstruct an original text become far more uh, important than they were before because you can see them. They become objects of interest. And in many cases, they're more important than the modern editions. We will never have the, the texts of Galen on medicine be medical textbooks again as they were in the past. Those earlier versions are in some ways more important than a modern reconstruction. So the challenge is to think about how to make our Greek and Latin texts useful to a global audience uh, and useful to each other. So when you, create a, when you create a digital version of a Greek or Latin text, it's going to interact in real time uh, with all the other Greek and Latin digital texts that exist right now. This requires a rethinking of what an edition looks like. When I think uh, of an edition of Greek and Latin, the apparatus criticus, the way to try and show different versions of the same text becomes only one of a number of components uh, we now use, for example, capitalization, we split up words, we have punctuation, uh, we put in paragraphs, we add a lot of annotation to our printed texts. But in the 21st century, these, this annotation can include our precise interpretations of, of the morphological and syntactic function of every word in the sentence. Uh, instead of having an index of names in the back of the book, we can link the people and places in a text to uh, machine actionable sources so that we can analyze the relationships between people, look at the geographic spaces uh, that are implicit in a document. Uh, 
we can detect text reuse, who quotes what, at a level of precision that we could not do before. There are a number of things that we need to think about uh, when we produce an edition, uh, and we need to think about this dual audience, how other machines are gonna analyze the outputs of our interpretations, and how other people around the world are going to understand the text that, upon which we have worked. How do we use our work as students of Greek and Latin to promote a dialogue between people from very different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. I'll finish by saying, my, what's the role of an edition? Well, I need an edition of Herodotus uh, that would support a conversation with my colleagues in Iran as we approach 2,500 years uh, from the time when Xerxes uh, led an expedition to Greece. And what would happen if we had a dialogue, uh, a scholarly dialogue with people from a very different academic background in Tehran or the holy city of Qom, talking about what they refer to as the Athenian Wars. How do we make our Herodotus accessible to them? How do we make uh, Old Persian, the inscriptions of Xerxes and Darius, accessible to us and to them so that we have a new kind of mutual understanding? The addition the digital edition is the foundation of such a conversation.